In regards to the strategy objective three, um, the group thought that the commission should be careful and it should stick to its mandate. And in a way, the commission might be better off doing less. So in that expected results, there's a problem with implementation, which can create conflict of interest going beyond the mandate and weakening the credibility of the commission and also a conflict with the sovereignty of member states. And we recommend to the commission in regards to the role of advisor to work with the OAS at the diplomatic level to reach to the states instead of a direct contact with the countries, thereby safeguarding independency and the commission's legitimacy. And also to avoid, again, sticking to its mandate, to avoid the application and promotion of the conventionality control as this is beyond its mandate, which is just as with the margin of appreciation within the purview of the court. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Llamamos ahora a la representante del Grupo 2, Sara Harris, from World Vision, para presentar la sistematización de los debates relativos al objetivo estratégico número 1, consolidación del pensamiento y cultura de derechos humanos, y el objetivo número 4, con relación a sociedad civil y academia. Sara. of objective one, which was to promote the consolidation of the notion of notion and culture of human rights and to influence the regional agenda to confront the causes of human rights violations and all forms of discrimination, authoritarianism, violence, inequality, and poverty. Under result one and some of result two, I haven't been able to systematize it completely. Um, First, we encourage uh, greater diversity in the materials created and disseminated by the commission. For example, uh, the use of executive summaries, visual reports, fact sheets, infographics, and videos. Um, but when using these materials, it's critical to always uh, have in mind a specific audience and the specific message uh, that we want to bring to those audiences to avoid additional confusion. I uh, was recommended to consult with uh, the target audiences as to what images and messages would resonate, resonate most with them. Um, within the materials that would be created, um, it's important to uh, have greater information as to what is the inner American system, how does it work, how is it relevant um, to the particular audience, and how can that particular particular audience engage with it. Um, the need for greater innovation around information and technology for collecting and monitoring reports on human rights um, so that that information can be consolidated and made more accessible um, as to what already exists and what are the evidence-based tools that have been proven to, to work. Consider trainings on information security. While mobile phones are definitely a tool, um, they can also be a risk. So we would like to promote awareness raising and protection of information. Uh, it was recognized that there should be a specific targeting of the international economic system providing capacity building, as well as diverse mater materials on what the human rights framework is, um, to try to the sort of divorce that exists between economic policy and human rights. 
finally, under uh, result one, bring greater awareness uh, to the inner American system by uniting and making a clear connection between human rights and domestic law. Um, this would help encourage uh, greater relevance for the public and um, encourage greater interaction between the two. Uh, result number two, um, specific targeting is needed of the U.S. government, um, provide capacity building as to, to promote the human rights framework and bring greater understanding um, and, and use of the human rights language. Also under result two, explore opportunities uh, to train corporations, to train the private sector within the region um, on human rights. What are the international laws and obligations uh, that exist and what role uh, do those corporations play within the, within the human rights system and what is their obligation? Um, with that in mind, uh, it would also need to be sort of sold to the private sector as to what could be the potential uh, benefits for them in, in engaging in the human rights system and, and fulfilling those obligations. Finally, under result three for objective one, um, develop models to better engage youth, um, potentially an adaptation of the model UN to attract uh, youth at large, um, and then use more digestible, accessible information for youth, um, limited words, and, and uh, messaging as to ways that youth can engage and take action. Um, in addition, we had objective four, which I won't read for time. So under result one, um, we'd like to encourage the commission to continue um, this, this participatory space in the sense um, that there should be some sort of monitoring of the strategic plan. So at the midpoint, at the two-year point, um, again, invite the civil society organizations back to evaluate uh, how far we've come and where we're headed for the last two years. And then again, at the conclusion of the four-year period, um, encourage uh, civil society engagement and participation in evaluating the, the strategic plan success. Um, we want to encourage the Commission to uh, conduct outreach to promote awareness of, the, of human rights as well as the Inter-American Commission, but we recognize that there are limited resources and there is a distinct need to strengthen certain functions within uh, the Commission um, to ensure its sort of effectiveness at the core. Um, make uh, commission spaces more participatory, or make spaces and um, encourage more participatory opportunities, um, allowing them to be more accessible, thinking a bit about logistics. Um, it would be helpful to have greater advance notice of thematic hearings, as well as greater advance notice of events like this and, and our um, acceptance to participate. Um, consider more diversity and potentially be more strategic in locations for events and trainings, not thinking outside of uh, simply major cities or capital cities. Target U.S. groups and organizations that work uh, domestically, thinking that um, there's already potential funding that exists there and ways to, to better utilize that, those fundings and those relationships. Provide spaces and opportunities um, for more diverse groups uh, and organizations to weigh in, specifically children, adolescents, and youth, as well as other more sort of vulnerable groups, um, thinking outside of just uh, the sort of organized civil society. The importance to uh, consult with networks in order to uh, make the commission more accessible in the sense that ask networks uh, where should events be, when should events be, um, how would uh, the networks like to be consulted to sort of ensure that fluid communication and engagement. Um, encourage uh, commissioners and rapporteurs to use social media when possible about mandates to bring greater visibility um, and, and to make those commissioners and rapporteurs more, more accessible to the public. And finally, the use of other modes of communication, 
Um, it was mentioned the, the possibility of sending uh, text messages, understanding that the commission typically sends emails, but in more rural areas, um, there's limited access, so um, potentially a, a shortened text message could be an option. Result two, um, develop means to incorporate human rights into the educational system, um, develop a curriculum for teaching on human rights, um, continue to build capacity and um, develop capacity building materials that specifically tar target judges at the domestic, domestic level. Um, they often, domestic judges sometimes do not know how to in, engage with the international law, so linking um, international law to more domestic cases. And finally, result three, um, more law school clinics, uh, clinics that can actually file cases before the commission, uh, develop partnerships with universities, um, academic institutions as part of the human rights network, um, active sort of human rights defenders uh, that take an active role in monitoring human rights, understanding that this could be a bit complex with um, safety and, and confidentiality issues. Um, develop a matching program. The commission could facilitate trainings to universities and clinics. Diversify the profiles of interns and fellows and personnel exchanges to include activists and human rights defenders. Um, an exchange of information in terms of best practices and lessons learned would be a benefit. Um, and uh, within those, within that diversification of, of uh, interns and personnel, consider targeting folks with experience in specific priority areas. And finally, um, further explore opportunities to expand the internships to include field work experience. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Sara. Llamamos ahora al relator del grupo 3, eh, Fabiana Pardi, de International Service for Human Rights. El Grupo 3 eh, estuvo discutiendo los objetivos estratégicos número 6 relacionados a la articulación de los mecanismos y funciones de manera oportuna, adecuada y efectiva para una respuesta efectiva y para la ampliación, para la ampliación del alcance social. Y el objetivo estratégico número 7 relativo a la coordinación con otros organismos internacionales, regionales o subregionales. Okay. Um, so with respect to strategic objective number six, um, our group uh, had, with regards to the result number one, a recommendation that it should set instead of coordination mechanisms for a response capacity with is timely, which is timely and fast for the Inter-American Commission to situations of human rights violations in the region created and enforced, to say strengthen coordination also um, on the permanent panel to identify challenges and the juncture in the area of human rights, the recommendation would be to include language such as established channels of communication with civil society organization following the permanent panel. On the result number two, our group considered that this result is a priority and there needs to be better coordination. Also, this needs, this needs to include uh, coordination with precautionary measures as well. And on result number three, uh, mechanisms of follow-up to the recommendations of the Commission. Our group also considered that this result is a priority and looking at the UN system for best practices on follow-up um, could be one of the recommendations as well as better coordinating between the Commission and treaty monitoring bodies, exchanging information and marking recommendations between the different systems. For example, the Commission for example, have the Inter-American Commission make recommendations to states during the UN system. Um, also strengthen the follow-up mechanism, think uh, outside the box, for instance, expand the Inter-American Commission, the, inter the Commission's reach. Uh, and it's like it's uh, the initiative of the Commission to have reports, it's important, but uh, what are the specific measures that the Commission will adopt to ensure the implementation of the recommendations that are made in the thematic reports, so how to revive those recommendations in every state. Perhaps, for instance, during the visits or period of sessions, 
um, have an extra day and meet with state officials to follow up on those recommendations more specifically. Um, and also after the reports, um, uh, the Commission could also open a call for observation from civil society organizations to receive uh, information regarding the level of compliance with such, with such recommendations. Um, at some point we also discussed uh, the, uh, having a declaration on human rights defenders or declaration on the rights of migrants uh, as an important step that the Commission could take forward and also to have standardized ways of issuing the recommendations across the different reports, to have a chart to document, to document those recommendations with, men, with specific benchmarks and a timeline uh, with watch, oh, with, uh, that wa this was one of the discussions that we had on the group uh, and we highlighted the importance of having more transparency. Um, also, we uh, recommended to have rapporteurs present an annual report on their activities before the OAS political bodies to further engage with the states and to take from the UN uh, initiatives um, the way that they develop recommendations, for instance, in the treaty body. The treaty bodies, um, we mentioned that CETA committee makes standardized recommendations, like general recommendations. Uh, to all the states uh, it could be a, an, an important initiative. On the, um, the result number four, um, there is a need to establish uh, an equity and equi an equilibrium between rapporteurships. For instance, uh, through collaboration with academia, universities, and human rights clinics, which is a recommendation that has already been made by other groups. And uh, also the need to have a balance between expansion uh, to important issues such as disability and older persons and getting uh, on more work with limited resources. So this was also a consideration that there, we've seen in the strategic plan that there's a lot of expansion, but also um, the resources that the Commission currently has are not um, sufficient to fulfill all the work that it has. So how the Commission will approach uh, this uh, difficulty of expanding while getting more resources for these new mandates. Also ensure sufficient financial resources and means, uh, for instance, staff and personnel for the rapporteurships, including the new ones to be established and to conduct their, f in order for them to conduct their functions efficiently. The new rapporteurships on disability and older people uh, could perhaps begin as units instead of rapporteurships, as, as it has been the case of other rapporteurships of the Commission. Um, with regards to the honorary special rapporteurships that is mentioned in the strategic plan, we currently don't have enough information, uh, but it would be useful um, to open this uh, process of selling honorary rapporteurships to a separate consultation open to civil society to better understand how this Megan, like how these special rapporteurships will work um, with the current structure of the Commission. And also on follow-up on uh, hearings, on regarding public hearings, the Commission should systematically send letters to the states to follow up with the hearings, especially when civil society uh, makes recommendations to the Commission how to follow up on not only what happened in the hearing, but also with the recommendations that civil society members gave to the Commission. And um, finally, um, in the name of, trans like under the transparency discussion we had, the Commission should make publicly available the submissions made by civil society organizations that were sent to the Commission before the hearing uh, on the website so it is available to civil society um, and states as well, and to compile the recommendations and statements made by the Commission in one place on the website. And finally, on uh, the result number five, um, we don't know enough about the program uh, present, Inter-American Commission present, to comment on this. And it is important to promote the work of the Commission in the U.S., uh, given that uh, there was a general sense that the Commission is not very well known in the United States. And we had little time to discuss um, the strategic objective number seven, but in general, we do feel like it's important that 
to enhance the coordination and cooperation with the United Nations and to draw from uh, ex like best practices and important developments that have been carried out in the UN and other regional systems and see how to enhance cooperation and communication with special rapporteurs as well as independent experts that are working on issues that the Commission is also following. Regarding the um, joint mechanism, we also consider that this is an important initiative and this tied back to the mention that we made before about the Declaration on the Rights of Migrants or the Declaration of the Rights of Human Rights Defenders. This might be an important step given that, for instance, the UN already has a Declaration on the Rights of Human Rights Defenders. And we also consider that this mechanism could incorporate uh, a response to cases of reprisals against those that engage with the system. But in general, we find that this is an important initiative and unfortunately we didn't have enough time to discuss result number two and three but uh, hopefully we'll get to send any opinion by writing or continue to engage thank you muchas gracias fabiana llamamos ahora la relatora del grupo número cuatro angelita vayens del robert kennett center for human rights este grupo estuvo discutiendo el objetivo estratégico número 5 relativo al sistema de peticiones y casos, medidas, eh, soluciones amistosas y medidas cautelares. Sorry, we made notes on the... So we started with uh, some general statements that we want to make from the outset. One, that the petition and case system is central to the work of the Commission and should be prioritized among all the different um, strategic objectives. These should be um, at the forefront. Also, another general statement on calling for a better integration of the work of the rapporteurships into the petition and case system. And a third one uh, is, is very specific on the creation of a study panel that would have representatives, of course, of the Commission, but also the academia, civil society, even states, um, to study this uh, strategic objective in itself because of all the, how, you know, the, the different um, levels of even complication that, that it may present, it really requires a more in-depth study than just the time we had really to make more concrete recommendations. However, we came up with a couple of, of recommendations. Um, so on results one and two, the first one was to reassign more staff, so existing staff, reassign some of the staff to the petition and case system from other areas to really reflect the prioritization of this function of the Commission. The second one regarding these results, uh, to adhere more strictly to the rules, so the Commission should adhere more strictly to the when it comes to giving extensions to the parties to present <laughs> observations. There's a lot of back and forth, a lot of extensions that go well beyond the, the time frames that are uh, contemplated in the rules. And being a bit more strict or being very strict could actually help move the process of petitions and cases throughout the system a little bit faster. A third one is to outsource the analysis and drafting of admissibility reports um, to academic institutions with, uh, with whom the, the Commission would you know, have agreements, um, each com one of the ideas was that each commissioner could have a specific relation with three uh, academic institutions. And within those academic institutions, students, preferably LLM students, uh, would analyze and draft admissibility reports uh, under the supervision of a professor specialized in international human rights law. And of course, in close coordination and contact with the commission, and of course, signing all the confidentiality um, agreements and uh, disclosing any uh, conflict of interest, etc. <coughs> Sorry. 
Um, then there was a bit of a discussion on whether, you know, if the volume of admissibility reports increases, whether um, it would be possible, and that needs, of course, more uh, analysis on whether even the statute would allow that. But if the decision on admissibility could be left to one or half of the members of the commission instead of requiring the approval and analysis by all the members of the commission. So that could also speed up the process a little bit more. And then, so basically using some of the, the, the ideas that have been in the, the practices that the European Court has put forward to speed up the process and, and be able to deal with more cases. Yes. So, of course, for that first, the issue of the need to have more resources to actually analyze and produce reports uh, has to be addressed first before it becomes necessary for commissioners, you know, on a more individual basis to, to be able to decide on, on, on those reports. Um, and also on results one and two, extend the presultum criteria to all stages um, of, so not only to the initial petition, uh, analysis of the petition, but to all the subsequent stages as well. Then on result number three, which had to do with um, friendly settlements, we discussed that, you know, the practice of offering the good offices of the Commission on friendly, in, in, able, in order to be able to achieve friendly settlement agreements should be continued. However, um, a, a way also to, to help with that and to increase the capacity of the Commission would be to include um, pro bono mediation and get pro bono um, you know, assistance from firms that are specialized in mediation to intervene. Then something a little bit more radical um, and is to include with a series of exceptions of course. Um, mandatory, a mandatory meeting um, a mediation meeting before once a petition has been declared admissible in order for the, the case to move forward. This of course with a lot of exceptions and, and we did enter a little bit into that but it's one of those ideas that definitely would need a lot more um, analysis. And of course it would have to include very um, strict time frames and defined time periods so that we avoid uh, continuing what's going already uh, what's happening already, which is that friendly settlement processes sometimes take forever and then don't end up in an actual uh, agreement or an agreement that is complied with by the state. And um, on result number four, which had to do with precautionary uh, measures, the um, adheren ad adherence to general principles uh, regarding urgent measures, also being more strict on the time frames that are given to the state to respond to an uh, a request for addition for information so that if there's no response then the the commission acts rapidly and if there's enough uh, for the commission to grant the precautionary measures it does so without waiting indefinitely until the state actually provides uh, information um, result number five which um, had to do with several things, but including the, the like transparency and availability of, of information about the petition, um, the petition and case system. The search engine, the, it, it, would, it could be eventually an easy solution to, also, again, outsource, uh, as the court did in a way, um, the development of a search engine on the jurisprudence of the commission. That's something the commission doesn't have to do itself, doesn't have to dedicate resources to do, somebody else can do it for the commission. It would be great to have it, but it's something that the commission doesn't have to do itself. And, um, and also have an open list on where, basically where the petition is in, in, in the queue. So there's already the portal, but if there's a list with the numbers of the petition, more or less, uh, you know, have a, a better idea of where it stands in, in the chronological order to be considered. That was one of the proposals as well. And um, 
now I don't understand what was the third thing if somebody from the group wants to help. We talked about outsourcing. Oh, yes, outsourcing. Um, the development of, of guidelines on the criteria that is used, what are the certain definitions and concepts that are used by the Commission in its decisions. Um, and making them available in, on the website. Yes, thank you, Lily. So that the letters, um, when, for example, there's a rejection letter regarding a petition, the concepts that are used there are more clear for the person receiving the letter and not requiring the letter to be super detailed and go in depth into why a petition was, was not um, open and tra transmitted to the state. Finally, um, <coughs> with uh, results number six, which had to do with the relationship with the court, we talked about the need um, to harmonize the admissibility criteria that um, you know, I need for harmonizing and to agree, the commission and the court to agree on what the criteria for admissibility is so that petitioners don't face um, the problem of you know, dealing with a different criteria when the case actually reaches the court. And then the commission, and this is more political, but the commission should be pushing back on um, the very restricted role that it has before the court. Now, how to do that? That's something that it will be really the, the commission sit down with the court and and basically get back a little bit its its older role of, of or previous role of um, having the possibility, for example, to interrogate um, witnesses and expert witnesses without necessarily having always to justify an inter-American public interest. Uh, that's a bit more idealistic, but the, the Commission should definitely push back, and I think there would be a lot of support from civil society in, in having the Commission push back on that very restricted role. Anything else from the group? Okay, thank you. Muchas gracias, Angelita, y al Grupo 4. Llamamos ahora al Grupo 5, Úrsula Indacochea, de DPLF, para que presente las contribuciones relativas al objetivo estratégico número 8 de fortalecimiento de la gestión institucional. Thank you. Well, we were not really a group, it was me. <laughs> but, well, I, I um, wrote some ideas about this um, objective number 8. Um, uh, regarding the first result, institutional development, uh, the recommendations are to uh, use of a special platform for ESDA communication within the Commission and the, and the Executive Secretary. Um, it is important also to measure um, the results and, and the action and if the, re the results are really expected, not only using the indicators of uh, progress or success, but also um, identifying some um, indicators of recoil or uh, signs that will um, show us that we are going in the wrong way. Um, regarding the publicity and transparency, there are a few. Uh, it is important um, to give publicity to other instruments that the Commission uses. For example, uh, we think that the Commission should publish the Article 41 letters and the responses that the states give them. Um, it could also be regulated an easy procedure of access to, access to information and one officer responsible for this. Um, it is also important to um, try to um, promote the use of searching tools in the web page of the, of the Commission and to gather documents by topic, especially when it comes to precautionary measures. Um, the use of, of a language that will be easier for civil society groups to understand in the reports, it's important too. And 
the need of shorter, shorter reports focus on, on a specific issues instead, instead of these large reports that, that would take the Commission a long time to, to finish. Um, and it's important that uh, the civil society groups could know in advance which cases are reaching the merit stage so they can um, promote m m a more open debate about the topics, not the cases, but the topics, and raise awareness and international awareness on the topics. Uh, regarding the result number two, financing, um, it is true that there are a, a lot of needs and, and topics that should be addressed, but it's important that the Commission um, establish certain priorities and to focus on them. Uh, the, the, the topics that, that would be prioritized in, in terms of financing and also to um, identify all those activities in which civil society groups could be involved to, to help the Commission, um, especially those of promotion could be one that uh, could be like, more easily for the civil society to help, like organizing events to, to present the reports of the Commission in different countries, for example. And the use of uh, joint declaration with the United Nations reporters, uh, it's also important. Regarding the result number three, human resources, uh, it's, uh, we think that the, the Commission could explore the, the possibility of having an exchange program with, uh, for example, the European Court of Human Rights and um, to enhance the geographic uh, div diversity within the personnel of the Secretary. And finally, regarding the results number four and five, there are um, about processes and systems and timely and effective attention to the public. Um, we think that it would be very, very important that um, mechanism like the group of uh, experts of Ioxinapa could be regulated in as, as, a, as a more um, as a tool that could be used in other in other cases, um, because it's one of one, one uh, good example of of measures uh, that will allow the Commission to respond to issues in in real time, instead of of, of waiting months or, or or years to to have a response. So those would be my recommendations, really, for this subject. Muchas gracias, Úrsula. Y bueno, aprovechamos también para compartir algunas contribuciones que llegaron de la consulta virtual. Llegaron tres contribuciones puntuales específicas, entonces ya aprovechamos para eh, compartir. Eh, la primera que la CIDH pone en discusión, la cuestión de la necesidad de garantía de la laicidad y de respeto a los derechos humanos, que llega de la Red Nacional de Defensa de, de, Defensa de los Adolescentes en Conflicto con la Ley de Brasil, de RENADI. Una segunda para to encourage the OAS member states to set up stronger partnerships with faith-based organizations to fight risk discrimination against elderly and the sick of the and the sick and the right of life. Que llega de Marlene Gillette Ibern de Puerto Rico, Guadalupe Center for Life and Family. Y una tercera que llega de San Francisco de Justicia Internacional, Carlos Suárez relativa al uso de nuevas tecnologías en la práctica de los derechos humanos, que recomienda un proceso de innovación tecnológica centrado en el ciudadano y los actores que en la práctica participan aguas arriba en la defensa de los derechos humanos, potenciales víctimas, defensores de derechos humanos, periodistas, especializados, testigos y todos aquellos que a través del uso de tecnologías de base capaces de proteger al ciudadano en su justa aspiración y al disfrute, del pleno derecho, al plen, el disfrute pleno de los derechos humanos en la región. Y tecnologías capaces de mejorar 
el grave problema de la impunidad que confronta la práctica de derechos humanos a través de la mejora del proceso de aporte de la evidencia y otros procesos relacionados con los requerimientos de admisibilidad. Llegamos a tener cerca de 65 personas conectadas online en lo pico de audiencia en esta sesión, por lo que tomamos esta oportunidad para agradecer inmensamente el tiempo, la dedicación, el fructífero y valoroso debate que tuvimos en la mañana y en los grupos de la tarde, ahora, tanto presencialmente cuanto virtualmente, y a todos ustedes que pudieron se dedicar a nos apoyar a construir este proceso del Plan Estratégico 2017-2020. Estamos acá con el Comité de la CIDH, que desde hace dos meses está internamente apoyando y haciendo todo un proceso de diálogo con las áreas de, las, con las áreas de la CIDH. Entonces, aprovecho para pasar también la palabra a mis compañeros de la Comisión, que están desde muy temprano sistematizando cada uno de los aportes que han llegado para que podamos ahora empezar una tarea importante de sistematización de todas estas contribuciones. Entonces, paso la palabra. ¿Quién empieza? A Marisol Blanchard. Bueno, nada, solamente agradecerles que se hayan quedado hasta esta hora y agradecerles que nos regalen su tiempo para pensar en esta institución que es de todos y de qué manera podemos servir mejor a las víctimas. Eh, y de qué manera podemos funcionar mejor. O sea, somos lo que todos pensemos y soñamos de esta institución y, y ese es el objetivo de este proceso. Así que muchísimas gracias por quedarse hasta esta hora y, y por regalarnos el tiempo para, para poder pensar una comisión más efectiva. Lili, sí. En adición a to what Sol said, I think that it would be, like today was a really interesting exercise and I think it's just an invitation to start thinking. And if you have any other thoughts that you think might be helpful, I think it would be really good if you can send them to the commission via the website, the, the, we have an address, right? What's the email address that we have for? CIDH Planeación, we will put it in the website because it's in English and CIDH Planeación. But if you have any additional um, ideas that you would like to put on the table, then we would be very grateful if you can send them to CIDH Planeación and always to invite everyone who's on the website uh, to participate in the rest of the, of the consultations that we're going to have in Tegucigalpa next week, in Lima the week after, and then in Kingston on the 3rd of March. Bueno, eh, no, yo creo que ya para, básicamente está todo dicho eh, con relación a este proceso. Agradecerles nuevamente en nombre de, del personal de la comisión que ha estado trabajando en este proceso. La, la comisión como un organismo que es patrimonio de las Américas se debe eh, a la participación de todos, de sociedad civil, de los estados, de las víctimas y yo creo que este proceso participativo de construcción del plan estratégico refleja eh, el interés que tiene la Comisión de responder a las necesidades y a las demandas de todos. Eh, muchísimas tareas, quizás muchas más de las que imaginábamos están ahora en, en manos de la Comisión a partir de este plan estratégico. Esperamos cumplir eh, a la mejor de nuestras capacidades con todas la, las tareas que, que identificamos como tareas estratégicas. Pero también creo que esto manda un mensaje de la Comisión que los usuarios, que la sociedad civil, que las víctimas, que los estados esperan y también pone la responsabilidad de materializar este plan estratégico en la acción coordinada de todos. Entonces, eh, yo creo que gran parte del éxito de ese plan estratégico va a radicar en la posibilidad de que todas y todos continuemos materializando y dando seguimiento a lo que aquí se, se compromete. Y por último, eso, en seguimiento a lo que mencionaba mi colega Lili Chin, eh, el proceso participativo de, de este plan va a continuar en otras partes de la región. La idea es que, que este proceso se siga nutriendo con los aportes de otras organizaciones de la región. La siguiente parada, por decirlo de alguna manera, es en Tegucigalpa, Honduras, el próximo eh, viernes. Así que les invitamos a que por favor eh, hagan extensiva la invitación a todas las organizaciones que conozcan, que trabajan en Honduras y en los países aledaños a Honduras para poder recabar los mejores insumos de, de la región. Muchísimas gracias. Bueno, eso sería todo de mi parte. Muchas gracias, Álvaro. Solamente unas palabras eh, en el sentido de 
repetir lo que dijeron mis colegas. Muchísimas gracias por la presencia de todos y todas aquí en esta jornada que es muy importante para nosotros porque es la primera consulta regional eh, de este proceso que estamos realizando. Y, y lo que es bien importante, más allá de, lo, de todos los agradecimientos que se dijeron hasta ahora, es cuál va a ser la utilidad de estas consultas y es algo que quisiéramos remarcar porque se dijo esta mañana, de que todos los comentarios que este, presentaron alrededor de la tarde van a ser sistematizados y van a ser considerados a la luz de lo que es el proyecto de plan estratégico y se van a someter a consideración de la comisión, además de que sus posturas van a ser públicas. Es decir, que este es un proceso que va a tener unos resultados concretos. Se van a concretizar, se van a considerar y se van a procesar para nutrir el plan estratégico, que es de todos y todas, y nuevamente repetir que este es uno de los organismos de, de los dos de derechos humanos de la, de, del hemisferio y que está destinado al servicio público. Entonces, este es uno más de los espacios y queremos contar con las contribuciones de ustedes y las vamos a trabajar concretamente. Muchas, muchas gracias por el esfuerzo, la compañía y la constante colaboración. Muchas gracias.